is it harder to go from Hupper to Nebraska or, or harder to go from Nebraska to international play? Nebraska to international for sure. And, and talk about that. What's the hardest thing? Yeah, it's funny because I, I remember coming out of college. And I'm like, you know, I'm pretty good. You know, went to three final fours, you know, I'm an all American, you know, like all these things. And then I was like, I don't understand why people think there's this like big gap between, you know, college and professional life. I'm like, I don't see it. Like, I feel like I can do it. I remember my first Grand Prix and we played Germany and just getting served off the court. I would hate to know like how many aces they had. Like, I want to say like 15 in like a three set match, which is like unheard of. I don't think that in college, I was more of like a line seam, which till this day, I'm more of a line seam hitter, but my first season in Russia, my coach was like, you need to learn how to hit four to four and, and hard. And so that was my first realization that I need to hit with more range. And what is that? What does hitting with more range mean? Like being able to tip and being able to see what's happening on the other side and, you know, making those decisions and the timing of those decisions, um, just how much that well, I still needed to learn, and um, but I, I was definitely naive and thought that it wasn't that big of a gap. <laughs> Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, authors books, and presents to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. Jordan Larson started every match in the last three Olympics. During her professional career, she's won awards in international competitions as the best server, the best passer, the best defensive player, the best blocker, and the best attacker. She was the MVP in the Tokyo Olympics. She talks with Terry Pettit about her journey from Hupper, Nebraska to playing in three final fours at the University of Nebraska and becoming what Karch Karai has called the best female volleyball player in the history of the United States. I'm Dave Young, producer of the podcast. Thanks for joining us. And now here's coach Terry Pettit. This is Terry Pettit, the host of Inside the Coaching Mind. And today we have a very special guest, Jordan Quinn Larson, the captain of the U.S. gold medal winning Olympic team in Tokyo. Jordan, uh, you know, I, I could list every award you've won, but the most stunning thing to me when I was doing research for this podcast is that in international tournaments, you've won awards as the best server, the best passer, the best defensive player, the best blocker, the best attacker. That pretty much describes an, an all-around player. <laughs> and uh, I suppose people at home think that you and I hang out all the time, but the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, beyond the fact that um, you're in, uh, in uh, California and, and I'm in Colorado, John doesn't let me talk to any of his former players. So this is our first opportunity um, the first time I saw you was at a qualifier in Denver, Colorado, when you were a senior, you'd already committed to Nebraska mm -hmm. and you were on the main court and I, I saw you jump serving and it was, it was evident from the first time I saw you that you, you had it all going. I mean, you could, you could do everything. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the, the people who have played the young women who've played for Nebraska, uh, most of them have come from uh, Omaha and Lincoln and the, and the mid and western part of the states. Hupper, Nebraska is probably as far east as anybody's ever come, although, and you may not know this, uh, a starting middle blocker in, in the uh, 1975, 76, 77 was from uh, Fremont. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nancy Wilkinson, she was a great player, went on to... Um, try to be a script writer for movies and a, and she was also a volleyball coach but um i'm i'm curious about several things the, the first thing would be who was the first person who was the first woman you saw playing volleyball and you said i, I want to be like her i want to do that it's mm. a good question um 
the first name that comes to mind is Angie Oxley, um, who is now Angie Barons, who is now the assistant coach at Creighton. Um, I actually took lessons from her um, at a pretty young age. And so um, as far as like, being close to my hometown, that's kind of, um, who I saw. And I just, I know I really admired like how she was on the court, just how she carried herself. And obviously her athleticism was, um, uh, amazing. Um, so I would say her, and then I, I really looked up to Logan Tom when I was, um, really young. Um, I was able to see the national team play a couple times. I think at certain qual- that was when back when we had qualifiers you know they had the national team in and around a little bit more so we can kind of um you know see the players you know more hands-on so I think for me those were two players that I I really looked up to and, and for those who don't know Angie Oxley she was an outside hitter and our nickname for her was uh, the stealth player yeah. <laughs> because you would watch a match and you wouldn't see anything unusual and then you'd pick up the box score and you'd see she had 15 kills, 12 digs, three blocks. Uh, she was just very efficient in her movements. Of course, everybody in, in volleyball knows who, who Logan Tom was. And did you two, were you on the same team in 2012? Yeah, we were. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and what was her role then and what was yours? Yeah, um, well, I think... Uh... I could be wrong in this, but I think Hugh's goal was to be the best passing team, right? Offensive wise. And, and so I think we both had a a pretty heavy role passing. Um, I think that obviously teams tended to serve me more than maybe Logan. Um, But um, we were both, I think, pretty well-rounded. I was definitely not to her level at the age that I was, but um, I think that we were both well-rounded volleyball players. And I think that's kind of what um, Hugh saw in both of us. And I don't think young, younger volleyball players and maybe even collegiate players understand the priority and value based on passing in an international player because the rules are different. Yeah. And if you can't pass, you can't play. I mm-hmm. mean, it, 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 and not just pass, um, pass well. You have to play, pass e- extraordinarily tough serves and all kinds of serves. And uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a passing demonstration like we saw in the Tokyo Olympics, where the number one, two, and three passers were the primary passers on the U.S. team. And um, I don't know, in the, in, the, in the Nations Volleyball League, were the three of you passing at, at that level then, or is this something that came about pretty much when you got to Tokyo? Yeah. Um, I think we were passing at a pretty high level. I mean, I mean, being, I, in general, I think as a national team, we pass at a pretty high level, more high level than most other teams. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the big rocks that, um, Car just talked about. That's, that's a key to us winning is being able to pass in system at a high level. And so I think while we were passing high, I think obviously Tokyo, it was just another, like we just went another level. I've never, I've never seen that from any of, I mean, I've seen it, you know, maybe two matches in a row and then, you know, you kind of have like an off night and then you kind of get back on the train again. But I mean, we were passing so well and it was, I don't know. I just felt like we, it felt like we were in flow state the entire the entire tournament, it was un- unreal. So, um, and there might be a few people out there that don't know what flow state is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but can you can you give us a, a simple definition for definition for what that means? Yeah, it just, uh, and I don't know if I'll be the best to describe it. It's just when the when the game all of a sudden just really starts to slow down. You're able to narrow your focus. Um, uh, Mike Trevay talks about your activation level on a, on a scale of one to 10, you know, we're always trying to get to a five. So we're not too activated, but we're right in that middle zone and, and we're able to narrow the focus into, you know, what's the next task at hand and how can we focus on that solely and then move on to the next play. And so honestly, it felt for me like those two weeks, like the game was just in slow motion. And, um, I'll be honest with you. I was, I'm usually at now I'm kind of taking more of Logan's role than I was, you know, the first quad, right. Where people weren't serving me as much, but 
in our gym, right before the Olympics, people, I was getting a majority of the serves and it was a struggle for me. I was doubting myself. My confidence was super low. I was kind of getting in my own head, like, you know, I'm known for this skill, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and how I'm supposed to be showing up. Like what happens if this happens in the Olympics, you know, it's all coming down to this moment. And so, um, I just, to have the outcome that it was, um, with how I was feeling leading up to the games, um, was a much different result than, um, I, I definitely was anticipating. So do you have a trigger or a cue you give yourself in those situations? Um, yes and no. I think for me, what I learned early on from coach cook, um, was I go back to 2006 before the national championship game against UCLA in the uh, semifinal. I didn't have a great match. I, Sarah, Pat, if we, if Sarah Pavin doesn't go off in that match, I don't know if we would have made it to the final. And I went back and, uh, they put like a, a reel of my highlights of the season and, seeing myself performing at a high level. I just always kept that in my back pocket, that that's something that has always really helped me get out of kind of these hard times. And so uh, what I went back to do is while I was at the Olympics, I just went back to where I felt the most confident and the most confident passing I felt was in, it's been, it's been a while, but I'm not that I wasn't feeling confident, but I went back to um, Rio Olympic games and I knew that I was passing at a high level there and watching myself do that repeatable action over and over again, that's where my mind went. And so I was able to see what I was doing and then translate it more in practice and then obviously into matches. So I think for me, that helps me a lot to get out of my own head. How much does um, breathing play into this, taking a breath? You know, I think for me, I I think I do that subconsciously. I think for sure that is very present. I'm definitely not one of those people that's like, oh, I have to breathe in this moment, in this exact time. You know, I, I, I try to be very present, but more, I think more logistically, like what can I do uh, to attack the other team or how can I see the game to like be able to um, kind of depict what's happening. And so that's more where my mind goes versus how is my like, uh, breathing going or things like that. I think I, I do a lot of that um, subconsciously. Right. Well, to, to the hundreds of thousands of fans who weren't anxious about your passing in, in the Olympics, um, it, you know, you weren't a surprise. Uh, Justin Wong Arantes, the, the Libro who was also from Nebraska, um, may have may have been as consistent as any player in the games. And uh, a, a lot of people want to know where did that come from? Yeah. How did? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, honestly, I think this her season overseas leading up to the summer, I think, really helped her. Um, she was kind of on a mid-level team in Germany, and she's going back to them. But I think it's good because I think in that state, she had to really con- control a lot of what was happening around her. So she was taking over half the court. She was communicating, you know, maybe when the coaches weren't communicating or things like that. And so I think it allowed her to get outside of herself and know that she can help a lot of people because when she came back in the gym, she was a completely different player than she's when we saw a year and a half ago, whatever, Um, just her confidence. And just like, you know, even there was a moment for me, you know, against Brazil, uh, they we had won like 25 I don't remember the first set and I was like guys I've seen this in London they came back and they killed I didn't say it like that but I was just like we have to be ready for Brazil to come back and Justine was like guys we got this like we just gotta do x y you know it was just like so calm and so like I was kind of a little fran- like pushing and like not frantic but just like I sense of urgency you know and she's just like we just need to defend and block well and we're fine you know so it was just it was cool to see her really just her demeanor changed, how she held herself, like just an absolute rock star. And um, yeah, I think she put in a lot of lonely work is what we call like work behind the scenes that not a lot of people are seeing. And um, she, she did a really good job. You know, that's the first time I've heard that term lonely work. What a great term Yeah. for someone taking responsibility for their own development. Yep. Um, uh, the third primary passer, passer, the other outside hitter, mm-hmm. might have been the player that going into it, I would have 
maybe had the most concern about. Mm -hmm. um, but, and she was targeted, I think, in the medal matches, but performed really well. Even yeah. when she wasn't attacking well, she continued to pass well. Um, and we're talking about uh, former Illinois player, Barsh Hackley. Um, and I, how much of an impact was, did, was Sue Inquist in terms of mindset? Uh, I mean, I, I know she worked on culture, yep. but did she work in any of this area? For sure. For sure. Yeah. She never, she didn't want to be called, you know, sports side because that's, she doesn't have that title. Right. But she was definitely a consultant for us. And I, we did work a lot on culture and as a team and how do we create a functioning culture and how can we respect one another, but yet hold each other, have this accountability system. And um, I think Sue had a lot of conversations behind the scenes that I think a lot of people didn't know was happening. You know, Sue has a way of, of getting to know you and getting to know you as a person and really finding what makes you the best you. And I think she talked a lot about like dropping the rope. You know, there's a lot of frustrations on teams sometimes, whether that's the coaching staff, whether that's, Hey, I'm should be playing or I shouldn't, you know, there's all these things that could get in the way. And so we really talked about like, Hey, let's just drop the rope, drop the frustrations, drop the, whatever you got, just let it, let it be like, let it sit. And we got to move through it. Got to move through any pain that we're feeling. We got to move through it as a team. And so I think it allowed us all personally to not sit in that. Like if we sit in that frustration, we just let it turn over and keep turning. Then it just creates a lot of unhappy people and a lot of unhappy situations. And so if we can all find a way to kind of work that in and work together, I think that's what we were aiming for. But I think that Sue did a lot of work behind the scenes that that I'm not even aware, you know, the conversations that she had with Bart or Justine, you know, Hey, this is what we need you to do. And, um, I think, um, it just, it, it showed up in the product and, and how people played. And she has credibility. I mean, she won several national championships for UCLA as a women's softball coach. She has, um, I, I think a strong, uh, emotional intelligence and, um, uh, and, and great intuition on things. Yes. So I thought it was, it was a brilliant move by your team to select her as, as a culture coach. And then my understanding is that the team interviewed several people and the team went back and said, um, this is the person we want. Yeah, yeah, no, we, yeah, I would say it was a year and a half, almost two two years ago. We just were dealing with a lot of, I mean, with any team, right? You go through ebbs and flows and there's some drama and just like, how can we make this better? I mean, it didn't feel, it didn't feel good. You know, it, you know, sometimes you're on teams that doesn't feel great. It's fine. You still win. But I think all of us were searching for some more meaning and like, what does that mean? And how do we want this experience to look like? And so some of us went to Karch and be like, hey, we, we, got, we have to make a change. Um, and Sue actually came on um, during the pandemic. We had guest speakers through the week and she just came on a Zoom call. That's how we first met her. And she was just talking about all these things about team and just she was so fiery and excuse me, like cussing every other word. And we're just like, who is this lady? You know, we're just like, what, you know, maybe not every other word. She'll, she'll probably yell at me for that. But just like, she was just so personable and like fiery and something that we felt like we needed because um, I don't know. I just think we were lacking that as a team. And so, yeah, we went to cards and we we're like, we like this lady. We need to have her on the staff. And um, yeah, she was a great addition and um and I think we could buy into like what she was saying and how she was saying it. And um, that was something that we were all playing for. Do you think she had an impact on the coaching staff? For Not sure. For sure. I think it was a good, cause I think there was a little bit of a disconnect between the players and the coaching staff, not in a bad way. Just, I think we were trying to understand what the coaches were trying to, you know, there was just this, kind of disconnect and so I think she was able to communicate like our wants and desires but then be able to articulate maybe what the coaching staff wants as well you know when you get to professional level there's a lot of different ways to play volleyball and you know some people have certain views and you know you know in Europe they train completely different than how we train here and so I think people spend a majority of time overseas but then when you get back in the gym it's just much different and so how can we 
kind of get on the same page quicker and make that happen more efficiently. And I think um, Sue did a good job of finding that balance of, you know, respecting us and respecting the staff and, you know, having a, a cohesive unit. So, yeah, I, I don't think most people understand how difficult it is to be a professional volleyball player playing in Europe or Asia for seven months and then coming back and training with the national team for five months. And you really don't have a break. And for you, it's been 12 years. I mean, you're the, there, there's one other player on the team, Faluka, that, uh, that was on the 2012 team, I believe. Yep. Yep, exactly. But for 12 years, you've been going full time yeah. without a break. And, you know, in, in basketball, they choose a team and they don't even go necessarily even go through tryouts with the with the men. They just 12 guys. We're going to take these 12 guys yeah. <laughs> and practice for a month and and, you know, call it an Olympics. Yeah. But it is. Um, if if we had if we had the resources for people not to have to go overseas, it certainly would en enlarge the talent pool, wouldn't it? Don't you think? I, of... I I definitely think. I think there's a lot of girls that choose to go another path because they don't want to be away from family and friends for eight months at a time, and um, it's it's also tough on your body. I mean, it's a grind. I mean, I think. The pandemic was probably, it's hard for, I know it was very hard, but it was like probably the biggest blessing, you know, for me personally, like I actually had time to shut, like shut it down, like just not do, like not, not do anything, but just not jump for a month straight, you know, and really like ramp back up. And, um, I think, um, yeah, I, I really think we could benefit from having more time in the States and more time at home. Yeah. Karsh Karai said that you were in the best shape of your life. Does that happen without the pandemic? No, definitely not. I was in not, it wasn't like horrible shape, but I was just in so much pain. I was dealing with plantar fasciitis, so I couldn't really maximize what I was doing. And I, if the Olympics were to happen the normal year, I definitely would have performed what, how I was um, this last year. And I'm just so grateful for that time. And um, honestly, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is a good or bad thing. I could be in worse shape, you know, like another year, another year older, you know, but I chose to, how do I want to feel and what I want it to look like and, uh, able to really benefit from that. Right. There, there, there's, a, there is some benefit from the, the trials and tribulations of going over there. Yep. It, it toughens people up yep. uh, to be in Turkey by yourself on a team where nobody else maybe speaks English yep. or, you know, and, um, but to do that for several years, uh, you, you might not need to learn that lesson again. You've already, you've already uh, experienced that. Yep. Uh, this is, this is an unfair question, but <laughs> not for me, it's unfair for you, but who's, who's the player you enjoyed playing with the most internationally who's the player when they were on the court you thought man i just love playing with this person she, you know she she makes this team better she makes me better yeah uh first person that comes to mind is maya poyak she is from croatia she's a croatian middle blocker um she was only on the court obviously half the time but watching her and how she handled herself off the court if she wasn't on the court, she was doing some sort of exercise in the corner, uh, you know, on her own, but just was always ready to come in. And I don't know, she always had just, you know, if I was, you know, oh, the coach said X, Y, and Z, she was just like, hey, like, it's out of our control, you know, or whatever, you know, she just always had a level head about herself and um, just someone I respect um, both as a person and just as a professional. I think she, she did a great job. When you were at Nebraska, who was that person? Oh, gosh. There was quite a few. I would say um, Tracy Stalls for me, I really admired kind of how she handled herself. I think, you know, she, I think she was two years older than her class technically because she like did something else and then came back to college later. So she was much older than some of us, but I thought she did a good job of handling herself. And then I thought, 
Christina Hotelling, uh, man, she was just a beast, beast and just all around great person, um, great athlete, just all around athlete, right? You put her in any sport and she was going to dominate. Um, and just how she got after it in the weight room. I've never seen someone work so hard in the weight room and it inspired me to like put time in there because it really, it really does pay off and something that I've really tried to translate as I've become a pro professional. I remember when John Cook was recruiting her and he came into my office and said, we can't make up our mind about this player. And he showed me a video and about eight seconds in, I said, what is, what can't you make up your mind about? <laughs> 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 she was, ex she was explosive. Uh, yeah. And man, my understanding, very coachable and yep. likable and uh, a wonderful player. Yeah. When, when you're, when you, you started, Every match in the Olympics for three consecutive Olympics. Uh, now, my question is this. When you're in that position, and very few people are, does it make it more difficult to become intimate or, or great friends with somebody? Because um, two months later, you might have a completely different lineup on the court playing with you. You have a different setter. You have a different Libro. You don't know who's going to be there. So I, I would think that there might be, plus some of those people are trying to win your job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, whether we like it or not, you had, uh, what, 23 people on this national team. Mm -hmm. All of them are fighting for 12 positions. And yet, uh, Coach Karai is also um, uh, educating and preaching about a, t a if we're going to be successful, this has to be a team culture. But how do you how do you get close? How, is that possible in that situation? Yeah, um, it's a it's a fine balance, you know. And I think that's something that I I think. Um, how do I describe it? I really love the game. Like I love, I like, I can't get enough people to ask, like I get asked the question a lot, like, what do you do outside of volleyball? And I'm like, well, volleyball like is a big part of my life. That's what I do. And I, I want to be good at it. And I want, I want to be the best that I can be right. And fully maximize my, my potential. And I think sometimes that that's not the norm, you know, people need to be able to step away and do other things. And, um, I, it's not because I don't want to do those things. I just know myself that I like to stay in this lane. And so I think that in itself is hard to kind of um, find people that are, you know, like-minded in that sense. But I, I've always come to a realization that like, not everybody, if everybody was like me, we wouldn't have a great team either. So it's like finding that balance, you know? And so I think um, just by nature that, I'm more focused on this side that I, I don't have the time or necessarily want to take the time to um, do other things. So I think in, in itself, it kind of self-selects um, a lot of people. And, um, but in general, it's, it allows a level of respect for what everybody brings to the game. And, you know, but I think it is tough to find and be close to a lot of people just because of the situation that we're in. But I think there's always been this like mutual respect and understanding of, Hey, it's about the team and this is what we're trying to do. And um, yeah. Did you or anybody on the team have any impact or were asked for your opinion on who else should be on the team? Um, yeah, so this was the first time that a lot of what we did as a team was democratized. So it wasn't just about like picking up the team, right? There was a lot of decisions that like, Hey, let's make a poll. If we, if nobody can make a decision, let's put a poll together. So it was like, Hey, do we want to eat on Friday night or Saturday night? All right, let's put a poll, you know? And so I think a lot of the decisions were majority vote and that's how we went about things. And so at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, you can get mad, but it's our whole team that's deciding at this point, you know? And so I think when it came down to um, roster decisions, you know, the coaching staff kind of really like 
didn't solely lean on our decision, right, obviously, but I think if there was any other underlying things that maybe they were not aware of or something like that, it gave each individual athlete the opportunity to voice those concerns and be able to choose who they felt like they would be best suited to play with. And so um, we did it for every roster cut. So it went from 23 Mm -hmm. to 18 to 12. And so um, it was, I don't know. I don't, I, I haven't asked people how they felt about the situation or if that's something they enjoyed or not. I know I felt like it allowed to at least have a a conversation with a staff if you had some concern. Um, And so, but then also got to choose like who you felt like could win a gold medal. And I think there's some buy-in to that. Like, Hey, these are the people I chose and this is, you know, who I wanted to to be uh, uh, winning with. So I think it, it added a layer of, um, of certainty, I guess you could say. Is it harder to go from Hupper to Nebraska or, or harder to go from Nebraska to international play? Nebraska to international for sure. And, and talk about that. What's the hardest thing? Yeah. It's funny because I, I remember coming out of college. I'm like, you know, I'm pretty good. You know, went to three final fours, you know, I'm an all American, you know, like all these things. And then I was like, I don't understand why people think there's this like big gap between, you know, college and professional life. I'm like, I don't see it. Like, I feel like I can do it. And I just, I remember my first Grand Prix and we played Germany and just getting served off the court. I would hate to know like how many aces they had. Like, I want to say like 15 in like a three set match, which is like unheard of. Um, But it was a gnarly jump and just, how people saw the game, how hard people were hitting. Um, I don't think that in college, I was more of like a line seam, which till this day, I'm more of a line seam hitter. But my first season in Russia, my coach was like, you need to learn how to hit four to four and, and hard. And so that was my first realization that I need to hit with more range. And what is that? What does hitting with more range mean? Like being able to tip and being able to see what's happening on the other side and, you know, making those decisions and the timing of those decisions, um, just how much that w- I still needed to learn. And, um, but I, I was definitely naive and thought that it wasn't that big of a gap. <laughs> yeah. And when people first comment about Jordan Larson, they'll say she has such a great understanding of the game. She sees the court so well, yeah. even when she's in a position to maybe not make the attack that she would like to make she knows where to take the ball she always betters the ball Mm -hmm. so how do you teach that yeah um i think it's honestly a little a long ways you know like a little bit each like sorry that didn't make any sense a little phase in each part of my life so like from club volleyball with gwen you know like learning how to move my feet you know being able to shuffle gosh how many medicine ball shuffles do we do underneath the net um you know like coach cook uh we did um what was it three the three man i don't know what he calls it i'm blanking now but learning how to play wingman in the back row you know if a player comes short i gotta fill in behind her you know learning like the ebbs and flows of on the court and how to like compensate for one another um i think all those little things along the way helped me be able to make that transition a little bit easier um, than maybe some other players have. But also I knew that, okay, I was an athlete and athletic, but I wasn't jumping, you know, 10, 11, 11, you know, I wasn't jumping high. So I was like, how can I figure out how to still win and to be efficient at a high level? And um, I think obviously my first international coach was Hugh and with the national team and he always talked about efficiency you know when you're passing you don't have time to pass and shuffle out we pass and you go directly to the ball you know and so learning that changed my mind learning how to pass the ball outside my midline um and you know having straight arms when I'm passing you know there's all these little nuances that really helped my career um go far and um yeah, I think that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's uh, all good stuff. The, earlier, you mentioned Gwen, your club yep. coach. That's Gwen Egbert. Yep. And you or I wouldn't be sitting here without Gwen. Uh, Gwen, Gwen uh, uh, coached Nebraska juniors for years and 
these were people that played all sports. They played basketball. They ran track. It wasn't like they were practicing three or four days a week. Yep. Some of them traveled several hours to, to practice. But the, the wonderful thing about Gwen is that she coached at the same level as, as a top college coach. She demanded the same thing. So when a player had, had, had played for Gwen and she came to a school and uh, she was about fit, she didn't funnel everybody to Nebraska. If she thought somebody fit better somebody, somewhere else, she'd call them up and tell them. Yep. But when they got there, they didn't have, uh, they didn't miss a beat. They, they already had, had uh, met those ex expectations. Um, you, you talked a little bit about Hugh. Uh, what else about Hugh? Um, you know, I, I don't know him well. Yeah. Uh, I would say that um, Hugh, Doug Beal, Karch, a, a lot of those guys appear like they're in the, the, the driest culture of, uh, of, uh, of buttoned up people I know. They're all great. They're all great coaches. But um, Hugh uh, has had unparalleled success, winning a gold medal with the men, a silver medal with the women's. What was the thing that you learned the most from him? Yeah. Oh, there's just like little things that I um, just like what I was talking a little bit about was like learning how to pass outside my midline, uh, you know, efficiency, like you know, and transition, you know, taking, okay, I learned that too in college, but I don't know. It's just like in transition, you have four steps on, you got to get back, but like going slow to fast to the ball and being able to be explosive, you know, I think back in the day, you know, hitting was like all about piking, you know, like how can I use my abs this way? And I had so many back issues, you know, but like learning how to twerk and like learning how to use my hips and like, you know, rotation this way um, and hitting more in a straight line, like trying to hit where I'm facing, but then also have this shot um, down the line. Learning like the decisions within a match. And I think even like we're lacking that just th through the board and understanding like, you know, if we're up by four points and we're clearly on a service run, why are we missing? Like, they're clearly struggling to side out. We have the advantage, keep the ball in play, make them play, the, make them make the error. You know, I think for me, that was like the biggest thing. It was like these ebbs and flows in the match, like learning like the momentum switches and when the time is to like really push ourselves and like, Hey, we just have to be steady and siding out. If you know, it's just a side out battle. It, it's all those little things that have like piled together that have like, I don't know, really like help me understand the game better and, and realize that kind of stuff. Have, so. you, have you ever had a heated intervention with a player that you didn't think was, was understanding things as maybe as well as she could have? <sighs> yes and no. I think, uh, I, w I wouldn't say he, I think sometimes I come across a little dry. That's not like intentional. I'm just more direct. I don't like to sugarcoat a lot of things like, Hey, like, why are you missing your serve? Like I still remember one of teammate of mine which she laughs we laugh about it now because we didn't have like the greatest relationship but she had missed like four serves in a row in practice and I was like dude like we can't do that like if we want to be at where we want to be like we can't like we can't have you missing like that you got to cut it down by 20 percent don't hit it as hard but like give us a chance like 25% chance you get it over the net. We have 25% chance of winning that. So like, I like our chances versus you hitting in the middle of the tape, you know? And so now did I probably didn't say it in that manner, but I, you know, I think it's finding a way I've learned throughout my career. How can I create a relationship with a teammate off the court that they know that I'm coming with the best of intentions and that I don't hate you. I don't dislike you. I actually love you a lot and I want to play with you. I just need you to make your serve, <laughs> you know? So it's just learning that and learning that over time. Um, and it's been something that I've really tried to hone in on and be more aware of. And of course, every coach is applauding when you said that, because it's so much powerful when that message comes from a team member yep. than from a coach. Yep. And uh, Karch uh, animated and said, and he really didn't go into it in detail, how important your le leadership was during a pandemic year. What do you think he was referring to? Um, I think 
I think most teams, I don't know, were kind of sitting through it all. You know, they were just letting people kind of like do their own thing, kind of have their own space. And don't get me wrong, we also tried to do that. But I was just like, this seems like an opportunity versus just something to be sitting and waiting for something, you know, and how can we use this opportunity to our advantage? And I think that's when Sue came in the picture and we committed as a team to like, Hey, we're going to meet once a month, which has never been done before on our national team, because once the national team ends, everybody goes overseas. We don't really talk to each other. We don't really, you know, as a national team, we don't really like conversate as much, but we committed to one meeting a month and we continued that through all the way through season. Some people had to miss obviously because of games, but I don't know. I just, I thought that there's a way that we can stay connected because we're not going to be able to be in the gym together. How can we stay connected and like have some sort of like benefit from this time? And um, I thought um, we just did a really great job, but I think, I don't know. I just always wanting to do something. And I, <laughs> I, I just felt like sitting waiting wasn't the, what wasn't the answer. Yeah. You flipped the optics on it. You said yeah. we could still, still get better, even though we, we uh, can't yeah. uh, um, f- about five or six years ago. I remember being at a final four and somebody came in from Europe who kept all kinds of stats on international play. And he said in women's volleyball at that time, backcourt attack was not particularly effective mm-hmm. in terms of the attack percentage. That certainly isn't true now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it certainly, your backcourt attack, uh, Annie Drew's backcourt attack, uh, Jordan Thompson's before she got injured. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm seeing the same thing in the college game. What happened to change change, uh, those statistics? Um, I, I honestly, we just needed reps, you know, we needed time, we needed reps. And, uh, a lot of us were doing it overseas. Like I was doing it on my club team, you know, but then we come back to the national team and it just wasn't part of our offense. And so I think that once they started just repping it out in practice and, you know, we maybe weren't setting in matches, but eventually we got more comfortable and trying to do it. And, um, I think that was kind of one of the answers. Right, right. Uh, several years ago, when I when I was coaching, uh, Kathy Noth, who yeah. is going in the Hall of Fame along with you, and Karen Dahlgren, who was National Player of the Year in 1986, went over to play on a junior national team in Europe. And they saw the slide run for the first time. And they came back into the, into the gym <laughs> and showed it to me. And it was like somebody showing you a machine gun. Yeah. It just... It was so dynamic, and teams had no idea on what to do about it. I remember playing uh, Texas, and they put their setter in the middle and their middle blocker on the outside. And, and I think it took several years before people under, understood how to, you know, how to set up a block on the slide. But it was a, the most important thing is, is that it was player-initiated. Players came back and said, Hey, we saw this. What, you know, uh, what do you think of? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about international play 2012. And uh, Logan would have been on that team and Destiny Hooker w- was on that team. And the U.S. lost, I believe, to Brazil in the finals. Is that the case? And were you up in that match? Mm-hmm. I was. Uh, was it was it 2-0 or not? I uh, no. So we won the first game 25 to 12, and then uh, yeah, I think we thought we had it in the bag, and they Brazil just came out firing, and we could not stop them. So and I imagine you carried that with you into the in that match in 2021 in Tokyo. The the memories of that, and that's why you went into the huddle, and Justine. <laughs> Yeah, call Justine. me down. Yeah, yeah, no, so it's so funny because I think in 2016, you know, with the Olympic Games in Rio, and we, that was one of the main conversations we were having was like, hey, if we face Brazil, you know, what is that going to look like? And how are we going to be? And, you know, we're in a, in a stadium full of Brazilians, like what, you know, what's going to happen? And we ended up never crossing with them. They got eliminated in the quarters. And so uh, we kind of dodged a bullet there because I think, you know, we just always have this this great history. And so 
yeah, when we got to 2021 and here we are in the final and we had gone to five with them at BNL and it was a tight match, super competitive. The match could have gone either way. I, you know, I just, I never, it's hard to beat a team twice, you know, like, especially at our level. Um, and three times is even tougher, you know? And why, so, and why is that hard, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, because there's like a lot of great athletes and it's, you just never know who could go off. You just well, and, and you also don't you also learn something when you lose. Yes, you, you know you tactically you can come back and say, well, we can we can alter this. Yeah, team that wins is saying let's go with the same same game plan. It worked. Yep. It worked the first time. Well, yep. in 2016, it was Serbia. Yes, and um, talk a little bit about that championship match. Yeah. Uh, so in 2016, we met Serbia in the semifinal and we um, went to five with them. Paluka ended up going down and she played the whole first set, which we won. And then I believe, and then uh, she did something in the first set, but then, so we pulled her the rest of the match. And I wouldn't say that wasn't like why we didn't win, but I think Faluka was a big offensive um threat for us and so I think when you're missing that for sure you know trying to make up for that was was a little bit of a challenge but I thought we we played well and you know again that match could have gone any way we lost 15 13 in the fifth and uh we go on to win a bronze medal in uh 16 but I think it was interesting to see how the 2021 Olympics played out with meeting them in the semifinal again and I think having Faluka and I there, which are the only two, or and Kelsey as well, and Kim, having us all kind of share our experiences and how we felt after that match and um, how we can approach going into that semifinal differently, um, I think uh, helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Kelsey Robinson, Kim Hill, and both of them at times in their career have been the MVP of international tournaments. Yeah. But you know, when we look at sports, and I'm thinking that you're, you're into golf now and your husband plays golf now, uh, you'll, see, you'll see some players that uh, have a window of three or four years where they're dominant players. And then there are a few, Mickelson certainly would be one, Tiger Woods, where uh, maybe for a much longer period, they're dominant. And you appear to have been that player in volleyball. I mean, you, you've played at a very high level for 12 years. That's um, the, the, the other women I can think of in the United States, Tara Cross probably played yep. uh, a similar amount of time. Certainly um, the middle blocker from Long Beach, um, uh, boy, I'm, I'm trying to think for a name now, played, I think, in four Olympics. Um, oh, uh, Daniel Scott. Daniel Scott. Yep. Um, but on this team, you're there, Faluk is there, the uh, Jordan Poulter has never played in an Olympics. Libro's never played in Olympics. Um, I don't know. Had Washington played? I don't believe she'd played in an Olympics. Yeah. So us four were the only two or only four that have repeated in Olympics. So Kelsey and Kim was their second and then right. and I's third. Yep. Right. And Kelsey and Kim were coming off the bench at, at that point. And then, you know, a few matches in, you, you lose maybe the most dynamic attacker on your team and Jordan Thompson, who just tore up everybody in the, in the first couple matches. Yeah. I remember Kart saying in, uh, when we did our podcast a couple of weeks ago, we don't yearn for that dominant player. Yeah. Well, well, you had her. <laughs> you you yeah. you had that player for a while, but he said we have to t out team other teams, and certainly at that point, that was the case. Mm -hmm. you, um, you know, the system had to create opportunities. Most college teams find themselves in this situation. Mm -hmm. You know, a few teams will have. There's probably four or five teams in the country uh, that have a player that can go up out of system and get put a ball to the floor, but everybody else has to rely on the system, the system doing it. And it was fun to see the United States do that because your passing created gaps and created an opportunity for Annie Drews to come in and play spectacularly at the right, 
at the right side position. But that doesn't happen if the U.S. isn't in system. You know, she hits a heavy ball, a hard ball, mm -hmm. but she's not quite hitting at the same geometry as uh, Jordan Thompson. Um, you also did something that you're, I've rarely seen in, in a college sport, and I thought um, Jordan struggled early in the tournament. And then you, you have that match with Italy, I believe, where she's injured, mm -hmm. and um, Micah. Micah comes off the bench. You're down one, two. I, I, to me, this is, the, this is the turning point, the critical moment Mm -hmm. in the Olympic Games, but I'm watching from several thousand miles away. Uh, <laughs> but the team finds a way to win, mm -hmm. finds a way to win. And then when Jordan comes back, she's a different player. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, I, I'm not going to speculate. I don't know her, um, but I have seen her play. And I always thought um, she had great presence and command on the court. Yeah, you know, she always looked like she was organized. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think people undervalue that in sport, particularly at, a, at positions like point guard or pitching or setter. Mm -hmm. But she came back and played her best matches in the semifinals and finals. There were two outliers for me in the tournament. The first was the match against um, the ROC, which, mm -hmm. which is Russia. And the, and the second one was the, the gold medal match. Talk about Russia. How, how does a team like that, now we all know volleyball where a wheel can come off at any time, mm -hmm. but how does a team like that play such a perfect match and then struggle in, in other matches? That's a great question. You probably know the answer more than I would. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how it happens. Honestly, I think. Um, I think Russia was due. I think they. Um, excuse me. Their ROC was due. Like I don't think they really. Like BNL, they were playing okay. You know, they have a new coach. You know, they have this young. This young number ten who's going to be a phenomenal player one day. Um, they have some experience, like in the setting and opposite position, but. You know, I just think they were due to kind of hit their peak, you know, and so I think they hit it at the right time against us. And I don't think we, I don't think we were playing horrible. I just don't think they, I mean, they were just playing better. They were playing phenomenal. And sometimes you just have those games where it's just like, they can do no, no wrong. And, um, but I think that match was a turning point for us. Um, just, it allowed us to make some adjustments i wouldn't say tactically but how we prepared for matches so and what was that difference what was uh, the yeah so i think we um our defense is based off of reading right like kind of how we see the game we do we have a general outline of what we're taking on certain hitters yes like hey i'm going to close line on this hitter i'm going to close cross but who is taking the tip or who is defending their sharp cross. It's all about kind of what we see and how we read it. Well, I think during the tournament, we learned early on that teams were tipping pretty early on us and, you know, balls were falling. And so I think we finally decided, decided to dedicate someone to the tip, not someone going automatically. It was, Hey, I'm playing defense, but I know that my first responsibility is to cover this tip and I'm pulling off the dig, you know, there was a little more cohesiveness on the defensive side. So we did more of a walkthrough, which I think took me back to college sometimes. Cause it, you know, we're, you know, John had, Hey, this is number 10. She's hitting here. You know, we did a little bit more breakdown uh, in the off day between of rotational work. And then how are we lining up on defense um, than we were doing like to start the Olympics and throughout the last four years. I mean, we really didn't, you know, do that kind of stuff um, because it was based solely on reading. That, that surprises me a little bit. And when you say they were tipping, they were tipping in particular when your middle blockers were serving and going over yep. to play angle, yep. uh, which is normally covered by the, the Libro. Libro yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in college volleyball, and, and I share this with every coach that I work with, if you position the Libro uh, about the 12 foot line on the right side and gave away zone five over, over your left side blocker, yeah. you would play many more balls yeah. 
than you do trying to play both. For and sure. Until, for sure. until you find out that somebody can hit that shot. And of course, at the international level, there are, are um, uh, people that can hit it. Um, we talk about a final four in college, but having to play uh, eight matches in a couple weeks, um, you're going to lose. You're going to, if not lose, you're going to have some matches where you, where you don't play your best yep. unless you're doing something that the rest of the world hasn't seen. Yep. And that's, and that's not likely. Um, so it, it isn't surprising. It's how quickly I think Cart said the most important thing in an international player, the players on the Olympic team to me is how they handle failure. Mm. And because the, you're, you're going to either going to have a match, you're going to have a critical point at some point, things aren't going to go your way and it's how resilient you are. And so obviously uh, he was able to infuse that into the culture yep. coming off that match with ROC. And for those that don't know what ROC means, it's, it's the name for the Russian Olympic committee. Um, but uh the the other outlier was the was the final match mm -hmm. and it, it reminded me uh, occasionally uh, you know i've seen it at the collegiate level you'll run into a team that has just run out of gas mm -hmm. and has done what they were capable of doing and they're playing at a they sense they're playing against a team that even if they play their best they're not going to win mm -hmm. And at that point, the USA was playing its best volleyball. Yeah, we really were. Yeah, I mean, I now that you like how you describe that, that makes sense by why it felt that way. Um, I was shocked. I've known Brazil for many years and just how they they're pretty good about like if one set isn't going well they can turn it around and you know where maybe there's other teams in the world that you know you get one set on them and they're just absolutely deflated and so I I just I was more shocked that they you know didn't fight back a little bit more but I think when they lost their opposite Tandara you know I think that was a pretty big hit for them because I think she took uh, a pretty big offensive load for them um, but in general I think they've been known to be able to figure it out, you know, and, and find a way. And um, so, but yeah, I, I think that, yeah, that was interesting to see. Well, you know, one of the, uh, uh, the two things that I want to do today, one is uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you and the team for winning the gold medal. And in particular, uh, uh, I know that all the women who have, uh, played on the national team. We want to thank you. The other, the other thing I want to do is congratulate you on your wedding to, to uh, David Hunt, who uh, is the, uh, I believe he's entering his fifth year as the men's head coach at Pepperdine. The wedding, um, my understanding, was officiated by Marv Dumphy, yeah. who is is friend of the world and the volleyball community. Yeah. Uh, to talk a little bit about David. Tell us about him. Yeah. Um... I obviously I met him on the national team and uh, he may be more into volleyball than I am, which is kind of uh, shocking, but obviously that's what he does, you know? And so I know I just admired um, who he was as a person and um, obviously who he was as a coach and um, how he handled coaching. And it was, um, I don't know. I, I think, sometimes when you get the professional people are often either scared to tell you something, or if they do tell you something and you may not like it, you know, it's like, how do you find that balance? But I just always felt like he was like really direct with me. Um, and then obviously that led to a, a lasting relationship. And now just watching him at Pepperdine and how he has um, just learned a lot from Marv and how he, you know, impacts these, young men and put them off into the world and being, you know, just great human and great people, um, is, is really fun to watch. And, uh, he works harder than any, I, anybody that I know, which is kind of hard for, I'm like, do you want to hang out with me? I'm over here, but it's good. Uh, he, he works really hard and, um, I don't know, I just admire him a lot and respect him a lot, um, for what he does. And, 
um, yeah, I'm just and, and David. I, I watched the podcast. He sees himself as an introvert. Yes. And 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 are you an introvert, an extrovert, or in between? Uh, I think I'm definitely more extroverted than he is, which was interesting for me because I knew him in the gym, which I think in the gym and and David outside the gym is very different. Um, because when I hung out with him outside the gym, he was a lot more quiet, especially when we would get in group settings. And I was like, huh, like, cause in the gym, it's just like, <laughs> it isn't, it's his natural, like this, he's just so comfortable there, you know, but he's more, yeah, just very quiet and reserved. And, um, when we're outside the gym, which I, I also respect. And cause when you're sometimes on all the time in the gym, you're like, I just need to be in my own little, <laughs> you know, quiet space. So, um, yeah, it's really cool. Will Jordan Larson coach someday? I think so. Uh, we are actually heading to Orlando next week, uh, actually this weekend, to do our first camp together. We're coaching a high-performance, I think it's high-performance USA Volleyball camp. So uh, I I really would like to work with him and, um, yeah, just talk volleyball a lot. I think it would be fun. And w when are you doing China? That That's... That, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I wrote them today. I was like, uh, should I get started on my visa? What's happening? So they are actually um, doing the China national games, which is actually really important to them um, there. And I think once that is finished, then they'll start talking about the league. So hopefully it happens. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of like, I'll just wait and see, see what happens. So. And then you'll come back for uh, another season of a of athletes unlimited and when is that scheduled for yeah that we still haven't released the dates yet but i think it's a, i think two weeks later than when it started last year so uh i want to say like beginning of march till middle of april um that's kind of the time timeline we're aiming it for. was really a lot of fun to watch it uh you know when i first heard the concept i didn't know what it would be i know uh, <laughs> and, and I, I think i shared with you maybe by email i i was disappointed that people weren't choosing setters sooner uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. particularly with the timing involved on a on, on backcourt attack, it surprised me a little bit. But but I think it had to do with what the personnel were there. And I saw Kelly Hunter at practice a couple of weeks ago, and I said, "Are you going back?" Mm -hmm. And she says, "I don't know." And I said, "You don't know, Kelly? Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think you finished third in that event, and uh, she's someone." I, I'm, and we haven't talked about it, but she's someone, my guess is, if she hadn't had to go to Europe to train in the off season, would be involved with the national team because she is such, has such a wonderful spirit and personality uh, for, for the setter, setter position. But my, my understanding is you were really instrumental in inviting players to be a part of that. Yeah, so the whole... Uh, to go back to the original statement, the whole concept of the league too, I was like, what is this? This isn't volleyball. Like, I don't know, you know, but I, I was like, man, this is our shot. Like we could actually, you know, have a league in the States and have it sustainable. And uh, I really just wanted to dive in. And um, yeah, so I'm part of the player executive board or play executive committee called the PC and it's made up of five players and we are basically in charge of all the recruiting so all the recruiting of athletes we talk to them we don't deal with like contract stuff that's um, through like one step above us who is now Taiba Hanif Park she's in that position so she deals with a lot of the contracts and yeah so it's been really fun it, it's um it's interesting, you know, trying to convince people to, you know, forego a long season and, you know, Hey, come play six weeks in the States. But a lot of people are interested. They want to, they want to see what it's like. And a lot of people want to play here. And, um, and I thought for the first season, obviously it's a startup league, but I thought it, it, it was tremendous. It, yeah, it was great. So oh. until I turn on the TV and be like, Oh, there's professional volleyball. Like who would have thought, you know, I, um, so I thought that was really cool. When we had, and I don't know if you had a chance to watch the podcast we had with Karch last week, but I felt he was wooing you. He was, he was, he was ho ho holding out hope against hope that he might convince you to go to Paris. Oh. <laughs> but, but, but I think you kind of set your course even before these games that this was going to be the uh, probably the last Olympic competition for you. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, I, 
everybody's like it's only three years and I'm like yeah it's so funny you like once you're on the national team all of a sudden you think of your life in like four-year cycles you know and it's like you kind of like prepare and that and I don't know I, I I now that I'm married I I would like to start a family at some point you know but obviously like who actually knows if that's god willing you know what happens with that and so um I'm just going to continue to keep in shape and um I don't know. I do think this is, that was my last competition. I think it's hard to like have a definitive, like this is it, you know? Um, it's so hard because it's like you devoted your whole life to something and you've given everything that you have and just to all of a sudden just let it go. You know, I think that's, um, uh, hard, especially when I have seen so much growth from like the younger players and like where they are today. You know, we talked about Jordan Poulter early on and just how, it's impressive to me. You're 24 years old and how she carries herself and how she like just has this presence. It's, it's, impre it's so impressive to me. I, I was in awe by how everybody that was their first Olympics, how they managed themselves. I, I, I don't remember myself being like that. I was very much deer in the headlights whoa, this is big, bigger than me. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, Jordan, we are lucky to have you. Nebraska was lucky to have you. The national team was lucky to have you. And I look forward to seeing you and you and Kathy go in the Hall of Fame. And, and you. I, I also want to say thank you to you. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to go to Nebraska. Like, I don't know. Like, you going door to door, like, I think that set up Nebraska level for like a many many years of success so I thank you for having given me the opportunity to play at such a great place and um I I you know I have to speak on our like our class so you know the pressure's on so you know I almost was gonna throw it over to you because and maybe that might happen so just be ready you might have to give a speech <laughs> well uh you're 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 very kind but um it is um it's it's certainly a uh, the, the thing the thing that I appreciate most about people like you and the other women who have played there is how they empower young women not just in volleyball but just how they empower them to uh, do extraordinary things and be assertive and it. Um, who would have thought when Title IX was passed in 1972 that it would lead to lead to this? And when you look at the success of women all across the country who have had opportunities in all kinds of areas because of the opportunity to compete in sport, it, it's wonderful. But, but you're very special, and I'll look forward to it. And thank you so much for joining us today and give our best to your husband. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.